You're listening to Superpower Curiosity with Dr. Richard Gillette. And I'm Molly Ruth, producer for the podcast. Superpower Curiosity Season 1 is about divisions and how to get past them. Richard writes all about this in his book, It's a Freaking Mess, How to Thrive in Divisive Times. For this episode, The Relief of Seeing the Bigger Picture, Richard reads an excerpt from the book. Here's Richard. The Relief of Seeing the Bigger Picture You may feel a number of upsetting emotions when you disagree with or dislike an elected president, prime minister, or other official, or when the party you oppose is voted into power. You may feel anger or disappointment that your preferred outcome has not come about. Over time, it helps to see the broader picture, how, for example, a two-party system tends to alternate and how public opinion swings like a pendulum back and forth. It also helps to see that over longer periods, say 50 to 100 years, despite the four-year, eight-year or even 16-year swings of opinion, there are some positive movements in terms of greater freedoms for more people. For example, women can vote. Following the first National Women's Rights Convention in the U.S. in 1859, It took 70 years of determined fighting by many courageous women for women's enfranchisement to come about, but it appears to be a lasting freedom. Seeing a longer time period for change is not to encourage complacency, but to avert a reaction of fear, anger, or despondency. Nevertheless, when I see people in power doing things I consider unethical, I sometimes lie awake angry. I'm unable to get back to sleep because I'm busy asking, how can they sleep at night? As if in answer to this question, I ran across a 1961 book I'd been given some 20 years before, The New World of Philosophy, written by Abraham Kaplan, who was then professor of philosophy at UCLA. The book had not been opened for many years, and smelled, not unpleasantly, of old paper. I had no intention of reading the book, but absent-mindedly opened it, scanned a few paragraphs, and was astonished. I had happened onto an understanding of ethics and morality that I had never come across before. The chapter described a 2,500-year-old Chinese classification of various levels of morality, based on the wisdom of Confucius, and Lao Tse. And, amazingly, this provided an answer to my question, how can they sleep at night? And how can I? Levels of Moral Attainment According to Kaplan's summary of ancient Chinese philosophy on morality, there are five fundamental levels of moral attainment, three of which are pertinent to the question of morality in politics. Level 1. No ethics within. At this most basic level, a person has no inner sense of morality. He conforms only to the morality that is imposed by others. He does whatever he can get away with. He might avoid something if there is likely danger of unpleasant social sanctions, such as imprisonment or death. In this category are psychopaths, sociopaths, and the kind of business or political leaders who damage others if they feel it benefits them to do so. It is to deal with this lowest level of morality that the most basic laws are required. Level 2. The Morality of Duty At this level, some ethical awareness has been internalized in the mind, but not in the heart. Emotional impulses are more or less contained by a wall of moral obligation. Thought and feeling may, therefore, be contrary, since duty may conflict with personal desire. Level 3. 
the morality of human heartedness. At this higher level, morality is based not on duty, but primarily on empathy for others. This is the level of the Confucian Golden Rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Choosing to behave with consideration, not because it's your duty, but because of your compassionate understanding. Here, there is no conflict between personal wishes and duty, because your empathy connects you to others. You want to be helpful because of this compassionate connection. The fourth and fifth levels involve the recognition and experience of oneness in all people. I think that a significant number of people who choose to go into politics are at levels one and two. People at level one, no ethics within, are often highly motivated to find means of gaining power, and politics may be one of these means. Level one people tend to do anything they can get away with in order to increase their power. Commonly, they experience positive feelings towards those who agree with them, and anger with those who don't. The conditional positive feeling may be labelled compassion or caring by the level one person, but it is actually a form of manipulation. The proof of this is that the positive regard disappears the moment there is disagreement. True compassion is unconditional. Level one people can sleep well at night because they believe that what they do is right, no matter what pain it causes others. Politicians at level two, the morality of duty, are more likely to follow the rules, but without heartfelt caring for those in the country they serve. Since political rules have so many loopholes, they have no problem using these loopholes to win political battles, even if their legal winning is inhumane, unethical, or causes suffering. They can sleep well at night because in their minds they have done their duty in following the rule book. Those at either level one or two are unlikely to move to a higher level of morality because their primary interest is success within the bounds they perceive, either the framework of whatever needs to be done to win or the frame of what is allowed by duty. Such people, therefore, rarely seek self-examination or change. I found that seeing all this was actually a relief. It was easier to accept someone's limitations than wage a battle in my own mind about how they ought to be different. Accepting someone's limitations does not mean we do not fight for better outcomes. It means we can fight more effectively with less anger and with more knowledge of what we're dealing with. Politicians at level three the morality of human heartedness, are perhaps rarer, though are more likely to act as true servants of the people. Level 1 and Level 2 politicians tend to dub Level 3 politicians as weak, unrealistic, or, in the US, un-American. The Sweep of History Whatever is happening now has very likely happened before, and probably many times over the centuries. Patterns repeat themselves over millennia. Those in power tend to do the same things they have always done, and remembering this perspective can be helpful. Throughout history, in most forms of government, for example, chiefdoms, kingdoms, feudal societies, communist regimes, fascist regimes, capitalist countries, those at the top often accumulate tremendous power and riches at the expense of the majority. In just the last hundred years, fascist dictators have maintained absolute power. Their will was what came to pass in the lands they ruled. Those who were caught disobeying were imprisoned or killed. Communist regimes used a convenient Marxist phrase, the dictatorship of the proletariat, to excuse the absolute dictatorship of the ruler who, effectively, owned every piece of land in the country. Those who were caught disobeying were imprisoned or killed. Capitalist democracies, to varying but often significant degrees, have allowed the very rich 
the 0.1%, to determine policies of government that increase the wealth of the already wealthy. Those who fought in equity did not usually die, but the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. In the US, 40% of the wealth is owned by 1% of the people. What those in power can and cannot get away with has varying limits depending on the times, the culture and the system of government. In the 20th century, Stalin, Mao and Hitler were, between them, responsible for the deaths of around 70 million people. Many millions exterminated because they were, or were thought to be, a challenge to the ruler. In elections in democratic countries, some politicians will do almost anything to win, though their choices are usually more limited by social regulations. In well-established democracies, politicians cannot, for example, get away with killing people, but character assassinations are okay. These politicians can't close down newspapers and TV stations, but they can rail against critical media or promise big perks to the media moguls who support them. They can't exterminate the educated classes, but they can remove funding for education and belittle intelligent analysis and scientific findings. In short, they cannot control the media, their opposition, and education as drastically as absolute dictators, but they can still exert considerable influence. The Limits of Democracy Democracy has limits, of course, and it's helpful to see these for what they are. Winston Churchill famously commented, Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. In the first century of its existence, the U.S. government did not allow women, Native Americans, or those designated as slaves, that is, more than half the adult population, to vote. Yet even this was an improvement over the democracy in ancient Greece, the first known democracy, where the only voters were upper-class males. Most modern democracies, including the U.S., still have their quirks and limitations. Consider, for example, these seven factors that affect democratic participation in the U.S. 1. The makeup of the U.S. Senate only partially reflects the will of the country's voters. Because the Senate, as stipulated by the U.S. Constitution, is made up of two senators per state, and different states vary considerably in population, the Senate does not represent the population proportionally. More than half of the senators represent 18% of the U.S. population, while the remaining senators, fewer than half, represent the remaining 82% of the population. 2. The election of the U.S. president is determined by the Electoral College and not the total number of votes cast for the competing candidates. This sometimes results in a president being elected without holding the majority of votes nationwide. 3. Supreme Court Justices, Court of Appeals Judges, and District Court Judges are nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, which is elected with disproportionate representation. This means that a Supreme Court Justice, a position of enormous consequence that continues for the life of the Justice, can be confirmed by a body, more than 50% of the Senate, that is elected by only 18% of the US population. 4. Some of the least wealthy citizens are effectively disenfranchised by certain state laws that require proof of identity that some poorer people do not have or cannot afford. 5. Those who have been in prison, even sometimes for minor offences or for offences no longer considered to be crimes, are banned from voting in most states for the rest of their lives. 6. Gerrymandering also disenfranchises voters. There are currently no laws against creating artificial political boundaries to give a political party with fewer votes more seats in government. 7. Some large corporations, run by the richest 0.1%, have a disproportionate influence on government policy.
You may not agree with every item on this list, or you may feel that there are mitigating circumstances with some of them. Most politicians deny, condone, or lament these limitations, depending on the advantages or disadvantages they give to their party. When you read the whole list, however, it is difficult not to accept that there is room for improvement in our democracy. Many democracies, perhaps all, have differing sets of limitations. There is, however, one limitation that is a problem in democracies all over the world, the last but definitely not least point above, the disproportionate influence of some large corporations. The battle to limit undue corporate power in politics has been waged by some governments with mixed success ever since modern democracies began. Large corporations may finance the election campaigns of most politicians, who are expected, by unwritten agreement, to protect the interests of the corporation above the interests of their constituents. Politicians who do not meet this expectation will not receive the same financial backing in the future and may not get re-elected. Big corporations have immense lobbying power. For example, in the US, corporations in the finance sector have 3,000 full-time paid lobbyists, five for each member of Congress. And these lobbyists pressure the government to create favourable breaks for the finance industry, even if this reduces the earnings or investments of the majority of the country's citizens. Which is what happened, catastrophically for some, in the 2008 financial crisis. Leaders of large corporations are often given high government office, and vice versa, the well-known revolving door between politics and business. Former corporate leaders may use their new governmental power to create policies that improve their business more than the common good. Most of the government leaders and advisers who created the policies that caused the 2008 economic collapse were formerly leaders in major banks. Many returned to bank positions after their stint in government. It had been in their financial interest to create legislation that favoured top executives in banks, even though it was not in the financial interest of the country or of 99.9% of its people. Media corporations may have a particularly strong influence on elections, since they have control over the broad content put out by the media they own. They therefore have power to sway millions of voters and to direct their audience to make choices for politicians who protect the media owner's corporate success. I mentioned in Chapter 6 the research that estimated that one media mogul, Rupert Murdoch, by telling his editors to write the opposite of what they believed, created more than half a million votes for Tony Blair, the politician whom Murdoch wanted to become Prime Minister of the UK. If one man effectively has more than 500,000 votes, how is that democracy? Seeing a realistic picture of some of the limits of democracy, or at least democracy as we now know it, may seem a bit daunting. But it can be useful in diminishing our outrage about particular events, events that we feel are unfair but which are allowed by current laws. This, of course, does not mean that we should not try everything in our power to improve our democracy over time. The future. Going over what I've said in this chapter, I have to admit that seeing the big picture is not a cure-all for our discontent with the powers that be. But it can help. The fraught, adrenaline-laden, oh my God, how could they do that, turns into a karma, here we go again, What can we do to change this? Dropping the frenzy feels a lot better, and it does not diminish our drive to fight for making a difference. In fact, usually it makes us more effective. If you're feeling upset about the morality of some politicians and the legally instituted limits of our democracy, there is something you can do that can make a difference to your state of mind and to your effectiveness in creating change. It involves focusing your energy on the future that you wish for, 
This is not a matter of some pie-in-the-sky placebo. William Blake wrote, What is now proved was once only imagined. Imagination really does drive change. This has been true of pretty well every human advancement. The 19th Amendment in 1919 gave American women the power to vote. But this was preceded by an unknown number of women over an unknown number of decades, imagining that this day would be possible, and then acting on that imagination. When we think of the limitations of what is happening now, our emotions tend to become adrenalized into, oh no, anger with the present and fear of the future. Unpleasant, sometimes paralyzing. But when we resolutely imagine the ideal, we are bathed in the elevated feelings of contentment, peacefulness, calm, compassion, kindness, and courage. These elevated feelings do not only feel good, they actually encourage creativity and resourcefulness. You can practice focusing on the future in the following exercise. Exercise. Time travel. If you're feeling upset about the actions or words of some politicians, or about the prejudices within society, or anything else that bothers you, you can change your present experience by focusing your energy on the future you wish for. Not only is this change of stance more enjoyable, it is also likely to make you more effective at creating change. The exercise you're about to do requires your undivided attention. In a while, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, so please do not attempt this exercise while driving. And it's great to do this exercise at a time when you know you will not be interrupted. Okay, sit in a comfortable chair and have a pen and a journal, notebook or paper to write on. The exercise takes about 10 minutes. At any time during this audio, feel free to pause the recording. Okay. Allow yourself to dream of a change you would like, even if it might seem unlikely in the present. Write down this change that you would like to see. When you're ready, close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths and relax your body. You can pause the audio as you do this. Now, I want you to imagine that you are sitting in a time machine. In this time machine, you see in front of you a green button marked Start and a large dial marked with every year from 2020 to 2099. You set this dial to the year 2050. In a moment, you are going to be traveling to this future year, 2050. Even though everything around you will age as you move into the future, you yourself will not age at all. Okay, you press the start button. You hear a swooshing sound. Within a few seconds, you have been catapulted into the future. The year is 2050. You get out of the time machine. It is 2050. You can see the change you wrote down earlier in reality before you. This change has already come about. How do you experience this new reality? What exactly do you see? What do you hear? Notice how you feel when you see this positive reality around you. How does your body feel? What emotions arise? You can pause the audio till you're ready. And now, 
still in the year 2050. You look back in time to see some of the steps that were taken to reach this positive reality. What key event or events happened that led to this reality you are now in? You can pause the audio as you witness this key step or steps. And now, still in the year 2050, but looking back a little further, what did you do that contributed even the tiniest amount to this new reality? What did you do that made a difference? You can pause the audio again. And now set your time machine back to the present day. You hear the swooshing sound again, and you're back to the present. Today. Open your eyes and write down what happened for you. Include the positive changes that you saw in 2050. Include the feelings you experienced when you saw these positive changes in 2050. Write down the events or events that led to these changes. And write down the action or actions you took that contributed, even the tiniest amount, to the future reality you envisaged. This is the end of the time travel exercise. Feel free to repeat it for the same or different situations. If you would like to go on and make your imagined contribution to your dream actionable, you can use the exercise in Chapter 9, Clarifying Power and Action. Thanks for listening to Superpower Curiosity with Dr. Richard Gillette. Episode 17 comes out in two weeks, so subscribe now. Next time, we'll tune in to hear Richard's Curiosity Room conversation with Mark Gerzon. Mark is an experienced mediator between Republican and Democratic members of Congress, the president of the Mediators Foundation, which is dedicated to bridging social and political divides, and the author of the excellent book, The Reunited States of America. In this fascinating and moving conversation, Richard and Mark explore the value of curiosity in transcending political hyperpartisanship and in fostering respect, kindness, and truth. Do you have a comment or question for Richard? Get in touch anytime at superpowercuriosity at gmail.com. You can also follow Richard on Facebook. Find his social media icons at the very bottom of the page at superpowercuriosity.com. Till next time, stay curious!